Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hope you've got your coffee filled now for the morning. Um, so, my name is Tom Ronan. I'm from VIV Solutions. Um, we are a market leader in products for test, measurement, optimization, and assurance of uh, networks, wireline networks, wireless networks, uh, working with NIMS, cloud providers, and enterprise. Today, um, I'm, I'm specifically from the uh, Fiber Optic Business Unit, which is part of the wireline group. And today, I'm going to talk about the benefits and challenges in FTTH. So first, we're going to look at the basics. What is PON? What's a passive optical network? What is the wavelength plans that we have today versus what's moving forward in terms of spectrum evolution in this space? And then we're going to look at f uh, failure mode. So I'm from a, a fiber passive background. Um, I'm not in specifically in the cable world, um, so I'll try to answer most of your questions as, as best as possible. But um, we'll be focusing on failure modes in terms of physical pa uh, passive plant. And then we'll look at some of the test methodologies that are adopted um, for construction and maintenance and delivery of FTTH services. So first of all, what is PON? So a passive optical network is, consists of many layers. Um, today, the focus uh, of my uh, discussion will be around the active and the passive. So the active layer consists of an active node. So this is the beginning point of your PON network, which houses the, trans the transmission equipment which sends your, uh, transmits your signal to your premise, to your customer or subscriber. This is often referred to as a central office or a point of presence, or in the cable world, a head end. Okay? Um, inside this node, or inside this uh, communications building, we have the optical line terminal. So this is the active equipment that sends the signal uh, outbound or downlink to the customer subscriber. And then, um, on the customer side, you have an optical network terminal. This is the active equipment which sends the signal back to uh, your optical uh, terminal, so sends and receives the signal coming up uh, and, and downstream. And then we have a passive layer, which in all intents and purposes could be considered a simple pipe, but in fact, it's far from simple. It really consists of many components, and those components are depending on the architecture that's used. Um, but first of all, we have our optical line terminals, which sit in our, in our central office or our head end, um, connected with uh, fiber tie cables over to uh, an optical distribution frame, which terminates off your cabling going to your outside plant. Then you've got your fiber cabling going out. You have numerous ducting. Um, could be aerial deployed or could be uh, uh, sub, sub ground deployed. And then you have your splitters assemblies, optical splitters, um, and cabinets further out in your network. So all of this, um, in including a drop terminal, which would uh, connect up your house. So there's many different components, and those components can have different failure modes. Um, and that is uh, what we will talk about a bit more today. So a PON system is not a point-to-point. -point, it's a point-to-multipoint network. So when we look at the technologies that are utilized, um, the legacy topology that would have been deployed um, many years ago would be uh, BPON, and that is as per ratified by the ITUT. So that gives us 622 meg down, 155 meg upstream, okay? And that uses ATM-based transport technology. That really has been surpassed uh, with GPON. So GPON typically gives you 2.5 gig down, 1.25, sorry, 2.5 meg down, 1.25 meg up, um, uses a gigabit uh, protocol uh, like Ethernet, um, and really could be also give you a 2.5 gig uh, asymmetric. In the splitter scenario, we are um, we have a split, a fiber split, which connects up a, a numerous a number of homes. So the maximum split allows, or the maximum number of homes connected, is 64. EPON is also seen as another attractive option, and this gives us a 1.25 gig symmetric transmission using Ethernet-based protocol. But when we look at some of the changes that's happening in the spectrum domain, um, currently GPON or EPON 
are seen as limited in terms of the number of subscriber or number of homes you can connect, right? So at GPON, we give an example of 64 being the maximum uh, number of homes connected. It also gives us limitation in terms of optical reach and user bandwidth. So the optical reach is effectively limited by the optical budget availability that's, that's part of the um, transmit and receive uh, optical equipment design. So in order to overcome these issues, a new um, standard was released, which is Tingig PON. So this improves uh, the bandwidth dramatically and also allows us to uh, increase dramatically the split ratio. So it gives us four times more bandwidth, so 10 gig upstream and downstream. And the advantage is it could be utilized over the existing plant that's already deployed if you had deployed fiber to the home. So the same fiber cabling infrastructure, uh, cabinets, connectivities, et cetera, could be reutilized. Um, this often called or also known as XGPON. So depending on which standard is followed, um, the ITUT XGPON1, which is ratified in 2010, uh, gives us 10 gig down. Um, with uh, 2.5 gig upstream. XGPON gives us uh, 10 gig, uh, XGPON2, again ratified in 2010, gives us 10 gig symmetric. And um, 10 g EPON gives us 10 gig downstream, but uh, can be flexible from 1 to 10 gig upstream. And the key advantage of it is it can coexist with the existing uh, PON solutions that you've already deployed. So when we look at that in terms of uh, spectrum utilization. Um, here's what the uh, existing PON network would look like. So we'd have our 1310 in the upstream direction coming from the ONT within the home, and we would have 1490 uh, downstream for data voice services. In addition to that, we could have a video overlay at 1550 nanometers, and then with the 10 gig PON for uh, high speed services, we have a 1270 nanometers upstream and 1578 nanometers downstream. Now, seen as a very attractive solution in the cable world is RFOG. Now, this is uh, radio frequency over glass. It's a really nice solution in transforming a HFC network um, from being a typical uh, hybrid uh, copper fiber solution um, so we'd have our head in going out to a fiber node or fiber hub and then uh, being uh, transmitted over the coax uh, portion of the network. So what we're doing is we are replacing um, the coax piece of the network in the outside plant with fiber. So RFOG is a, a solution which allows us to replace that and provide either reutilization of the existing coax equipment in the home are in the head end, so that's uh, reutilizing the uh, CT CMTS equipment, are delivering pure fiber to the home PON services connected uh, directly, fiber directly connected to the ONT. So the um, downstream and upstream wavelengths share the same fiber path, so there's no change there. So we have 1550 downstream, 1610 nanometers upstream for the return path. Um, to uh, transmit the signal up to the return path receivers. Okay. Um, really, the key advantages that have been discussed or seen in this area come from in, uh, numerous different areas. One is the downstream spectrum. So it's an improvement in the, uh, allows an improvement in the downstream spectrum. It allows an improvement in the upstream bandwidth. And the big advantage is power saving, right? So we see a lot of power saving in transforming your equipment from being a traditional, having nodes, <laughs> amplifiers, and so on in your coax, domain, coax segment of the network to having uh, pure fiber solutions uh, in that area. So drives more reliability uh, in terms of the fiber plant itself. It's a lot more reliable, <laughs> more stable, so less operational expenditures uh, ongoing. So the standard was put forward by the SCTE, so this is the standard 174-2010. Um, this was put forward by the SCTE in, in 2010, and I think was ratified in, in 2011. And the real goal was to give cable operators a viable option 
um, to be able to merge their networks towards FTTH, okay? So it allows them to reutilize, as I mentioned, the cable TV transmission technology and equipment in the customer side and in the head end and can offer uh, more flexible uh, service options in terms of uh, allowing overlay of a PON network. Depending on, the, on some customers in, in, in North America, we see fiber to the home mainly being driven uh, to single family homes. In Europe, we've seen uh, this structure being used for multi-tenant or multi-dwelling units. So this is just a, a typical example of uh, customer premise equipment that we would see in a PON or uh, FTTH RFOG deployment, okay? So what we have is from our OLT, we have a broadcast of 1490 downstream, but we also have 1550 RFOG signal downstream to the same location. Um, so we have then an upstream return path of 1610. So here we would connect our cable TV equipment, and here we would be able to connect, if required, upon, upon ONU. So we would have a 1610 upstream path on RFOG, or 1490, 1310 uh, 13 upstream path uh, if using PON. Okay? So here's just a look at the spectrum as utilized. So this is my downstream uh, video, analog or digital video. My upstream, um, my upstream path or my uh, return path, um, my uplink for data voice if I'm using PON at 1310, and my downlink uh, for PON at 1490. So now we start to look at the, this is a representative schematic of how this would look in a typical deployment scenario. So what we have is our RFOG equipment, our XG PON equipment, and our PON equipment, all transmitting at different signals and multiplexed onto a single fiber. Those signals are then put through a passive split uh, to it and could have an intermediate connection device like a drop terminal going out to our RFOG node. And depending then if you want to connect your PON service or your uh, RFOG services is what you would have coming upstream and downstream. Overlaid on that, you could also see you, uh, the Tingig PON, which again is using a different wavelength spectrum. Um, so 1578 um, in the uh, downstream and 1270 nanometers in the upstream. Okay, so we start to see a lot more wavelengths being utilized and a lot more uh, complexity in terms of when we're constructing or building out or activating the network. So what I want to talk about now is some of the failure modes we see when deploying or constructing the fiber network and some of the typical methodologies that's used for um, installing and, and maintaining. So when we look at the points of vulnerability, here we have a typical scenario. So we can have a single split scenario or a cas what we would call a cascaded split, okay? Sometimes a single split scenario is also called as a centralized split. So in this scenario, we have our access node, this is our head end, um, coming out with a feeder cable. This is the, by far the largest of the fiber cables going out to uh, a splitter point. However, the, there's limited updates in this area, so once it's deployed, it should be pretty reliable unless somebody comes and cleans out the uh, fiber cabinet by driving through it in a car or, or some sort of external damage to, take the, uh, to damage the cabinet itself. So this is the primary fiber connection point where sits the optical splitter or, and feed it to a distribution cable to a secondary split if that was in your network architecture and to a drop cable connecting up the customer premises. When we look at the vulnerability points, it comes back to the basic laws of optics. So it's usually physical impairments that are, on the, on, are created during construction of the network. So that impairment is dirty connectors, micro bins or damage to the actual optical fiber itself, damage to the splitter when loading or building it out inside the op optical cabinet, misalignment or poor splicing practices um, causing uh, breaks or damage or incontinuity with the fiber, um, and um, cross connects our uh, wrong labeling of fiber patches when we're putting it into our splitter, causing um, obviously ID issues between the OLT and the ONT. So there is, there is standards which govern 
the uh, several areas, and these are as defined by the ITUT. So first of all, what they govern is the attenuation ranges. The attenuation ranges are the optical budget availability is defined um, depending on the class of optics. Really, in an RFOG network, we are limited by the PON side of things in terms of the uh, physical reach of that network and in terms of the optical budget availability depending on the class. Also defines the ORL, the maximum ORL that's allowed as per um, of, of an optical distributed network or a PON network. Um, really that's uh, a, a measurement that is required when we have an RF overlay or an, an analog signal because it's a lot more sensitive to back reflections and the fiber itself. And we also define the maximum reach. And on the splitters, we define a minimum maximum uh, attenuation profile that is uh, allowed on those uh, splitters, depending on the split count or the split number, whether it's a, a 1 to 4 or 1 to 32. Okay? And also defined by the IEC is the standard for connectivity and what's allowable in terms of connector quality and connectivity quality. So looking at connector quality, um, we, here we want to look at well, what makes a bad fibre connection. So when we're mating two fibres connectors, connectors together, um, we have two principles. The first, well, three principles actually. The first is core alignment and the second is uh, physical contact. But in order to get core alignment and physical contact, you need a clean or pristine in-face on the fibre connector itself. If not, any particles of dirt that's going to be on your core um, are going to cause several issues. One is it's going to cause an insertion loss. So now I have light traveling through a refractive index of glass through air back into glass again, causing an attenuation over the connected joint. If it's a large particle and this is on your transmitter, it can cause a significant back reflection. Um, lasers do not like to see themselves in the mirror. Okay. And this can cause inverted problems with the, the laser cavity and the transmission and, and actual signal errors. So any back reflection can be caused uh, by dirt on the actual fiber itself. And third, and probably the most problematic, is physical damage. Um, there is a, a huge loading that's applied across a 240 micron area. That loading is going to create uh, a physical contact, is designed to create a physical contact between the two fibers. So any particle that's in between is going to get crushed or fragmented into the core of that fiber. That unfortunately is permanent damage. So if you do that during the construction phase, it's going to be permanent on the network and can only be removed by repolishing or re-terminating that particular connector. So, Putting this into a typical optical budget network budget scenario, um, what we've done is simulated some of the connectivity that would be involved in a, in a PON network. So here we have a, a connector on our OLT, connectors on our optical distribution frame, connectors on our ONT, then we have splitter connections, splice losses, and splitter losses. When we accumulate all of those losses, and so this is a typical connector losses, what we're looking for is 0.25 dB per connection. Sometimes 0.3 is also allowed depending on the standards that are set by the particular operator. So in terms of for GPON, um, maximum allowable budget is 25 dB. So if we accumulate just the losses associated with a good or pristine or uh, well-installed network, we're typically looking at about 22, 23 dB, giving us a, a very tight headroom in terms of optical budget availability. So, I guess the point I'm making here is a single contamination could be the reason you, you're preventing your service from turning up effectively. If we look at a clean connector, this is a, an image of a fiber connector in face. Okay? This is with no particles on there. This is what the core of the fiber here and our cladding area, and this is the ferrule area, which is on our uh, fiber connector. So typically, we're looking at a, a loss of 0.25 with a low back reflection or a low return uh, loss from that particular connector. If we look at the back reflection of a dirty connector, you can see it's increased dramatically. And this particular one, because of the size of the particles and the location of those particles, has caused a 4.8 dB hit on the, on the link. We've simulated that here using an OTDR trace, which gives us a signature of the, 
uh, fiber um, when measured using an optical time domain reflectometer. So this is a clean connector, clean connector, and we can see here a dirty connector. If we plug that back into our optical budget, all it's going to take is one dirty connector on our optical splitter, and we're unable to turn up that service effectively. Okay? So it's important as part of the planning phase and the deployment phase to ensure that those connectors are clean and pristine. There is a standard which governs what is a clean connector and what's a dirty connector. Um, that standard is IEC 61300-3-35. And effectively what it's doing is dividing the fibre connector into four zones. So your core zone, your cladding zone, your adhesive zone and contact zone. And it's given clear limits of what's allowable and not allowable in each of those areas to ensure or guarantee the performance of that connector. And simply by just doing an inspection process as part of the uh, build-out phase, you can uh, see whether the connector is dirty or not dirty and ensure or guarantee the performance during construction to ensure the longevity and the lifetime of those connection points. So when we look at network testing phases, really the network testing phases depends on your network scenario. So here we have a single split or centralized split scenario with a fiber feeder cable coming to a splitter, our distribution cable coming out to a drop terminal, and then our drop cables, once those homes are passed and those services are getting activated, we drop a cable from either the drop terminal or the splitter point into the home or into the ONT. We also have a scenario where, as I mentioned earlier, we have a cascaded split. So we have a single split on uh, the primary uh, fiber connection point and then a secondary split at the secondary fiber connection point, again, to get a greater reach or uh, a larger serving area utilizing the same OLT uh, equipment. When we look at the methodologies that are used for measurement of uh, the measurement of the fiber or the construction of the fiber, there are usually two methodologies that are used. One is insertion loss. So this is using an optical light source and a power meter. So effectively what we're doing is injecting a known amount of light into the fiber and measuring the actual uh, power or the actual um, level at the far end or at the receiver to see is the optical fiber cable in accordance with, or the optical plant built in accordance with the environmental requirements of the equipment and the transmission uh, within the transmission opt optical budget. Um, clearly before doing any of this measurement, what we do is we typically reference out our test leads so that we ensure that we um, have eliminated any loss associated with our test leads. An optical uh, Time domain reflectometer, and OTDR, is another solution that is commonly used for deployment of PON networks. Um, this acts as a much like a radar type approach to a single end of test, which allows us to measure attenuation, locate faults, um, characterize discrete events in the network. So what we do is we inject a, a, a known amount of light or a pulse into the fiber. And what we're looking for is the backscattering within the fiber, and we're separating that backscattering, sampling it over time, and getting a signature or trace of what that link looks like. So we actually get a signature end to end and allows us to characterize each of the discrete events along a fiber link. So this allows us to qualify not only end to end, but also qualify splices, connectors, splitters, and the fiber attenuation itself along the, the way as well as being able to pinpoint any faults or problems that are on the link in terms of bins, breaks, or, or uh, problem impairments. So it goes without saying patching is, <laughs> and continuity is, is one of the primary causes of issues and confusion when deploying uh, FTTH, especially when we have a foreign or alien uh, ONT being connected to uh, an OLT. Okay. So in order to eliminate that, it's a simple process. All we do is a continuity check. So we use a, a visible light source or a, a fiber identifier to trace the actual fiber link from the ONT, from the home, back to the splitter to ensure that we're not uh, cross-patching or incorrectly patching the wrong customers, which effectively would cause ID issues and, and turn-up issues during the activation process. 
So first we look at the construction and acceptance of the outside plan. So this is the feeder cable and distribution cable. Um, this is what would typically happen. We would build it out to a distribution point or to a splitter point or to a drop terminal and then start marketing to that particular neighborhood or serving area on available services um, for drop, dropping in services at a later point in time um, as part of the, when the customer subscribes to his service. So as I mentioned, inspection and cleaning of connectors is, is required. Um, measuring insertion loss um, is seen as good, but also um, doing an OTDR trace gives more information regarding the signature of that fiber and gives us uh, events information along the link. And once we've completed those measurements is documenting those results. So um, we call this as-built documentation, which shows what the quality of the network was like when we built the network, so we have reports to uh, ensure that when we're going into a maintenance cycle or an operation cycle, we can refer to a reference later on uh, down, the, down the track or down the line. So really when we're looking at the construction phase, and this is a cascaded split scenario, we really, the most optimized way to test the network is to consider it as a point-to-point -point network. So we would test each one of these links individually. So you test your feeder cable, you would test your distribution cable, and you would test your drop cable as a simple point-to-point -point network. It is by far the easiest way to deploy and to uh, test. However, there are some limitations. If this is a splice scenario, there's no actual fiber connections, sometimes because of the optical budget availability, operators tend to splice at some of these points, which effectively gives us a problem in terms of being able to do a measurement, okay? So in that scenario, you would have to test through the splitter. So as I mentioned before, um, the OTDR is looking at the backscatter signature from the fiber itself. So if this is a splice network, what we're gonna see is the backscatter from all the individual connections that are along the link. So this is a typical measurement. So what we're doing is in, uh, doing an OTDR measurement from an OLT. But see what happens when we shoot through the, uh, through the splitter. We're getting the back signature of all of the links that are on there, which is really of little value or very difficult to interpret in a normal field test environment. So this is not a recommended process for, let's say, construction testing. There are ways that uh, has been devised in the market for monitoring. So when it's post-deployment, when it's installed, um, using reflectors at the customer end allows us to be able to monitor effectively all of these different homes, um, but from a construction perspective gives us some challenges. So typically the test is done from the customer end. Um, now, what we're doing is we're shooting an OTDR trace on the, on the fiber link and doing it as part of the construction test. So what we're doing is we will measure the drop cable, measure through the splitter, and qualify the feeder cable all in one measurement. Now, this is okay when it's a dark fiber. There's no OLT uh, uh, there. However, in certain scenarios where your customers are already lit and you need to qualify a new drop or a new distribution segment, then uh, you are shooting into active equipment. In this scenario, you would use an out-of-band service, and in, in some cable solutions that we've seen, uh, you need to be careful um, uh, not to disturb any of the harmonics or uh, modulations that's in the actual uh, transmitter itself, and so that would recommend it to be a, a tested approach to ensure um, that was an effective measurement. With any OTDR, there is trade-offs. So, we use both a long pulse and a short pulse. A long pulse is required so that you can see to the far end, allow you to reach over a optical splitter, so you get more what we call range. So this would allow us to see into end end the network. However, if you get more range, you increase the dead zones, so it increases uh, the resolution effectively of the OTDR in, to, in being able to distinguish events that are closely spaced together. So to overcome this, we use shorter pulse. So this gives us uh, less dynamic range, so we won't be able to see as far into the link, 
especially uh, in some scenarios over a primary fiber connection point. Um, but it gives us a lot more resolution and a lot less dead zone. So typically in FTTH, what we would do is we would use a short pulse first to qualify the near-in fiber on front of the splitter, then use a longer pulse to be able to qualify into end, and then a lot of OTDRs today have solutions which combine those pulses to give you a simple schematic diagram of um, an icon-based diagram of what the link looks like end-to-end. -end. So it has smart algorithms built in to allow you to do a full end-to-end -end qualification. So once we've constructed the network and we've got our homes passed, we look at the turn-up or activation phase. So typically during turn-up, we would run a power measurement. So this is where my equipment is already activated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a power level certification. So I would do a level measurement at my cabinet or at my distribution hub, depending on where you've set as your connection point for your drop cables going into your home. Okay. What has to be considered is the spectrum, what was actually available on the link. So typically uh, at the home, we would do an upstream downstream. Um, and at the fiber connection points, we would do a, a, just a downstream only or a downlink only. And here we see a scenario where we would have different wavelengths. So you're 1310 upstream, 1490, 1550 downstream. So what we're doing is qualifying each of the individual uh, wavelengths and e individual powers to ensure that they meet the system requirements and that they're at the right levels during the activation phase. Here we have a scenario which shows it the same, um, but with the XGPON overlay in the same, uh, coexisting on the same link. So a normal broadband meter doesn't work in this scenario. So what we have with PON is we have um, burst traffic, so it's time division multiplex. So each O and T has its own time slot, okay? So that means that we have peak uh, burst traffic in the time division multiplex phase. So each O and T would have its individual time multiplex. If we were to measure that with the standard optical power meter, what we would get is the um, average level, so the average power across the, uh, across the signal, and not the peak power, which is the measurement we want, because we want to be measuring the peak traffic as it's transmitted from the ONT. The ONT actually does not transmit upstream unless it gets a handshake from the OLT. Uh, ONT does not transmit upstream unless it gets a handshake from the OLT. So there has to be a true connection, or a, what we call a selective PON meter to allow you to do its passive true connection to activate that signal and to allow you to do a level measurement. So typical test for an activation phase, well, first you obviously ensure that your active equipment is outputting at the right power, so you do a live power measurement of 1490, hook up the OLT, and then you would do your measurement. At, this is if only a PON service. You would do a 1490 measurement at your optical splitter and our 1550 if that's present also. At the home side, you would do a true connection, so you connect your 1490 into one port, and you would connect your ONT in the second port, which would give you full qualification of the upstream, downstream power levels, um, and um, obviously at the peak power as per um, any and PON transmission. So if we look at the maintenance and troubleshooting, well, first of all is we need to consider what is the actual problem. So if there are no ONTs responding, so I've got a network and all my ONTs aren't responding um, and aren't communicating with my OLT, then it points to a problem being behind the splitter. So you would do a measurement from your splitter point back through your network to try and find where it was because um, your problem is somewhere in this area because all ONTs are not responding. If there's a few ONTs responding, then it points to a problem being between your splitter point and your ONT. So again, you do an optical level measurement to define whether, well, is it the ONT itself or is it the actual fiber drop? Um, the issue with doing this, if there is a problem, so you've got a level measurement, you need to then determine the location of the problem. So once you've determined that there is a power issue or there is a level issue and it is on the drop link, you need to find the location of where that problem is. And as I mentioned earlier, you would use a filtered 
in service OTDR at 1625 or 1650 nanometers, which is outside your transmission band, uh, to allow you to do an optical measurement or an optical OTDR trace on the, on the link. So <clears throat> just to uh, summarize, when you're considering testing or measuring, you need to look at what is it the, uh, that you're actually transmitting on the, on the link itself. So you need to consider the, which segments are those work groups are working in and have they qualified their own particular segment or own build. Um, you need to also look at, well, wh what is it there uh, in terms of transmission signals that are being used and are those tools being utilized uh, available or easy to interpret the results so that you can quick, get quick diagnostics and quick qualification of the optical fiber plant, right? Um, I think one of the clear things that uh, advantages that we've seen in many areas is having clearly defined acceptance methods and methods and procedures per segment so that the technicians know exactly what levels they're looking for at what particular points and what the correct test method is um, for that network scenario. Um, inspection is a big problem in, in deployment, right? Connectivity problems and, uh, is, is a big issue. And, uh, Proactive inspection um, is, is considered a good practice in ensuring the performance of those fiber connectors and ensuring the longevity and the life of those fiber connection points. Um, having as-built documentation and build records will actually reduce further operation maintenance costs down the line. Um, it, it ensures the longevity and the robustness of the network as part of the build phase. And again, just to reiterate, you, selecting the instruments Today, you need to consider of what technologies you're deploying in the future, whether it's PON or FOG or XGPON, so that your equipment is future-proof to be able to um, handle those different network scenarios and different network technologies, um, so that you have a, re a good return on investment in the test and measurement uh, tools that you select.